this is <laughs> this is a a, a a a unique opportunity to record a pairing a coding pairing session so it's me chris coyer and i have with me kyle simpson hey he- kyle hello everyone <laughs> yeah and and this is really cool this is a uh it was kind of a, a session that i that i lined up through kind of a kickstarter thing although i know kyle anyway we probably could have done this anyway but the idea is i was like oh i'm gonna take this opportunity to learn a bunch of stuff from kyle this is gonna be awesome and <laughs> and kyle says i'll tell you what i'm uh uh you know i've been like you know a little bit like burned out almost on javascript but i got into this project and it dang near saved my enthusiasm for some of this stuff right now and it's like uh it's like basically creating a game in javascript and kyle's got some stuff cooking so we're going to take a look at his game and we're going to learn tons of stuff about basically like javascript and canvas and gaming on the web so let's do this thing awesome yeah um well thanks everyone for uh joining in for this fun little experiment i have no idea how it's going to go, but we'll have fun with it. As, <laughs> uh, as Chris said, um, yeah, several weeks ago, back over the holidays, I was kind of feeling some some drag and some burnout after a long year, a lot of travel. And I thought, hey, uh, I need to do something fun or I'm just going to give up on JavaScript entirely. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll just make a game. I mean, that's how a lot of people get into programming is wanting to do games, but we never take the time to actually do it. Uh, so I thought, hey, I will actually do that. Um, now I'm not a game developer, um, and I'm also not an artist. So the stuff that you see is not going to be amazing, but it has been a lot of fun. And as Chris mentioned, it has brought me back from the ledge in terms of my sanity. So, <clears throat> so where this started was I, I started playing around with some different ideas for casual gaming, kind of like on mobile. And um, some of you listeners may have played some games in this particular genre. For example, Angry Birds or Flappy Bird. The guy that made Flappy Bird also made a follow-up to that game called Swing Copters. That's the one I'm currently addicted to. And he actually made Swing Copters 1 and Swing Copters 2. So I'm currently addicted to Swing Copters 2. Nice. I I thought there was a little... Flappy Bird, if people recall, I mean, I don't even have a screenshot handy or whatever. It's basically like you hold down and the thing goes up and you're trying to avoid obstacles. It was like a really simple input mechanic, but was also frustratingly difficult. And it was, it's interesting that he made a follow-up game that, that so it was, he wasn't a one-hit wonder. At no, he, he, made, he made two, so he's made three that I'm aware of. Swing Copters yeah. is even harder. So the thing with Flappy Bird, it wasn't that you press and hold, it's that you tap and it makes the bird flap a little bit up. So you have to tap, tap, tap if you want tap, to go tap. up. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, and that's the part that made it, that's like so easy it sounds and yet so difficult. Um, swing copters is even harder because um, there's direction to it. You're moving upward and trying to avoid obstacles while you're flying upward. And um, you tap once to go left and then you have to tap again to go right. So you're tap, 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 changing direction each time. Uh, so it's exactly Ooh. like the hardest version of what you could imagine with Flappy Birds. He put it into another <laughs> game. Uh, All anyway, right. Well, let's check out yours. You know, I uh, I decided I wanted to make something kind of in that similar idea to Flappy Bird, and what I've created is called Cloud Sweeper. Um, I will take a look at a little bit of the code, but I just want to highlight a couple of things before I even show you this stuff. As I said, this is straight up like silly amateur stuff there's nothing professional happening here but there are some interesting things to observe the first of which is I chose web technology Uh, I didn't build this in flash I didn't build it in Swift or Objective-C or Java or any of that I chose web technology Uh, and that's on purpose I'm sort of doubling down on the fact that the web needs to win and the web needs to win by us betting on it and I think it's up to the task so uh, you see here it's just straight up HTML and there's going to be some JavaScript involved Um, the entire game I've probably spent maybe 80 to 100 hours at this point just kind of on nights and weekends over the last six to eight weeks so this is not super intense in terms of time Um, and it's a maybe 3000 or maybe a little more than that lines of code at the moment that we're recording I do intend to kind of take it a little further, make it into a game. Um, But you'll notice there's no frameworks involved or anything. This is just straight-up JavaScript. I've 
got jQuery here so that I can like do some events and stuff, but there's nothing complicated with it, and it's straight up a Canvas game. Everything we do is going to be drawn to Canvas. Um, I want this to work on all screen sizes, so all the images are SVG. Now, I'm not actually drawing SVG on the screen. I'm taking the SVG and drawing it to a Canvas so that I can manipulate mm. stuff. Well, I've already learned something. I, I kind of knew you could draw images to Canvas, but didn't realize that SVG could be the source. Yeah, yeah. So that literally I'm creating image elements, and we'll get into this, but I'm creating image elements where the source is an SVG file. And then uh, because that scales so well to any size, I can just draw it to whatever size I want directly to the Canvas. So, so okay. that's the structure of what we're getting in. But before we get into the boring code stuff, I'm sure people actually want to see some uh, gameplay. So let me just pop up Cloud Sweeper. Here it is uh, in all of its terrible glory, uh, the game that I've uh, been working on. So uh, I'll start off with the easy mode. Just uh, Actually, I'll start off with medium mode here. And I'm going to be playing with my keyboard. You can play with keyboard, mouse, or touch if you're on a touch device. I'm holding down the key to make the plane go up, and I'm trying to hit clouds, and I'm trying to avoid those pesky birds. And uh, if I miss clouds, my sun meter goes down, and the screen starts to get darker. And if I hit them, my cloud meter goes back up. Or my sun meter goes back up. And well, there's plenty of mechanics here. There's things moving around. There's yeah. meters. There's scores. There's inputs that need to happen. As simple as this looks, there's plenty of stuff going on. That's exactly at any right. Given moment. It's kind of right in the middle. Right? This is not like even remotely in the same boat as complex as an Angry Birds, but it's a lot more than just you know snake, for example, a little line moving around the screen. So there's definitely some stuff going on. Because I was betting on web technology. It was important to be able to do this kind of stuff in the most efficient way possible because I know my you know Mac MacBook Air here can can draw things pretty well and pretty fast, but I want this to run on an iPhone or an Android device as well, and mm -hmm. so I can't be building things that only work on a computer and won't work on mobile, for example. So, all right, so we will, we'll hit a bird here and fall out of the sky, and there's my game over screen. So that's about it. There's a welcome screen with a little bit of animation and stuff. There's a game over screen and some play in between. Now, what we're going to build today is way simpler than this. But what I did was I started with the code base that I've built with Cloud Sweeper and kind of stripped out a bunch of the uh, extra stuff that we don't need to deal with and gave us a... I wouldn't call it a framework. It's not a framework. I don't make frameworks. But it's the starting point. It's some boilerplate starting point for how I might approach a game. And I want to talk to you um, briefly through the Cloud Sweeper code base so that you're aware uh, and you'll sure. see the simplified version when we get to that in a moment. So <clears throat> as you can see back here in the code, I've got some JavaScript. Uh, I have each entity in the game is represented, uh, each entity that you interact with is represented by a JavaScript file that that's a module. Now, each entity, like a b like the, I see bird uh -huh. JS there, the exactly. little birds are exactly. independently controlled. So that it's just that's just how your brain decided to segment this. Basically, yeah, it was it was an arbitrary choice in terms of division. You'll notice that my plane actually has two different independent parts. The body of the plane, which is at, you're being moved at an angles, and then the prop of the plane, the propeller of the plane, which is spinning. Um, and so I, I just divided those up into two separate parts. Mm -hmm. um, the clouds is sort of like a, a factory that generates each cloud that is being shown on the screen, whether it's the background or the clouds in the foreground sure. or whatever. This isn't that wildly no. different than choosing to separate your web app by feature and sub feature and stuff. It's no, exactly. Same. It should yeah. be very. It should be very similar to those kinds of decisions. Where I think uh, listeners may see things differently is that there's no overriding framework that is forcing me to make decisions in a particular way because there's a right way to do it. Like there's a right way to do stuff in React and in Angular. There's no right way to do things when you start from the ground up. But I'm trying to take um, the most basic approach to code organization that I can. And I certainly have a lot, you know, I can improve things a lot, but the goal here was to kind of keep things a little bit separated. So for example, uh, the screens one, this is what's handling the welcome screen, the game over mm -hmm. screen, for example. Well, um, we're going to get to see it right here. So. Yeah, I just wanted uh, to show I mean, you. So, in the first second, we get to see, like, ooh, which pattern is he going to use? Yeah, <laughs> so right off the bat, you see I'm using a straight-up iffy. Uh, there's no mm -hmm. complexity here. 
um, I'm going to create so that's a module like a button. immediately invoked function expression, which is that weird uh, parentheses you see yeah, at the very top, right which means that that like whether you call it or not, that function is going to execute at least once here. Yep, that's, that's kind exactly of the pattern. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and and you'll notice we'll scroll down here for a minute. You'll notice that I have a public API. Uh, so I declare an object. I like to call mine public API. These are the methods that are going to be exposed publicly, um, uh -huh. and I return that, and that's about it. So it's it's you know by nature it's a closure. There's some there's some variables in here, but that aren't kind of accessible to the outside world unless you you choose to expose them through this public API. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now a lot of people turn to classes when they want to organize stuff, and they think, oh, I need to I I, I got to make something in a class. Well, there's some questions that you should ask about whether or not a class is appropriate. Uh, the first biggest question about a class is, am I going to make more than one of something? And here, these are sort of not going to be made a whole lot of. Uh, there's only one welcome screen and one retry screen, and there's not multiple of those that get made. It's always the same one. So that doesn't really scream out at me, uh, I need a class. Another thing is if there's some sort of natural composition or what people like to call inheritance involved where there's some base abstract thing that I can have multiple mm -hmm. different dependents that override and, and uh, augment behavior. There isn't really much of that here. So nothing about this screams out at me, you need a class and I don't immediately jump to using more complex patterns just because that's what everybody does. I try to use the bare minimum to get the job done. Here, the module pattern is more than sufficient, and that's that's what we're mm -hmm. using. So, I, <clears throat> as you can see, I have a couple of objects that I set up here. One for the welcome screen. It's got. Well, this a, just looks like data to me. It's not it JSON, but it looks like JSON. It's just kind of like the, I'm going to organize my JavaScript such that there's some like clearly easy to see and access and change data. The that's, data isn't buried around in functions and stuff. It's all right here. That's exactly right. And this could be externalized into other files, but part of the reason why it's in the code is I don't want you to have to go looking in 15 different places to find information. Information. So right here, the data that tells us what the welcome screen is. Now, these the width and the height tell me the native width and height of the SVG file that I created. Uh, of course, it's going to be scaled, so that's why we have the scaled object, which represents the scaled version of it at any given screen size that you're running at. But these are sort of the native things. And then the hit areas, as you might imagine, this is de delineating the bounding box for those three buttons for the easy, medium, and hard buttons. And of course, when I scale the screen, I'm going to need to create scaled versions of those hit areas as I, as I will fill in down here uh, so that those coordinates actually match to whatever your screen size is. But this is all like native coordinate stuff. And there's no magic here. I opened up a graphics program with my welcome SVG in it and moved the cursor to the top of the easy button and recorded the coordinates. That's it. Um, so again, trying to be as simple as possible. So that's how I'm going to deal with the welcome screen and the retry screen. And then I also included in here some elements that aren't a screen themselves, but elements that are going to be used in other screens. So the scoreboard, the sun meter, the bar on the sun meter, and the game over text. Those are elements that can be used. And they take the same approach, which is the individual element comes, you know, the source is going to be made into an image element. Uh, but then we're going to have a scaled version of it that we cache in here. I should mention that I'm using these canvas elements um, to cache the scaled versions of the images, and that's an, an important uh, performance thing. Um, when you're drawing images directly to the main visible canvas, that is really not performant. That's a really slow operation, comparatively mm -hmm. speaking. But if you draw, I mean, you've got to do it because that's what a game does. You got you to. Be but if you draw you it to a background canvas that's not visible, and then draw mm -hmm. from that canvas onto the main one, it's all like fine and happy and fast. So it's <laughs> weird. So canvas to canvas yes, is fine, but exactly. file to canvas is not so great. Yeah, it, it, when your image has SVG in it, and the SVG could have gradients and textures and all that stuff, you want to pre-cache all of your scaling. So that's what all that's about. Um, but there's really not that much complexity here. Let, let me scroll down just a moment. The loading, for example. So I'm just going to loop through all of the screen elements creating an array using some mapping here and also add on the elements, um, the game, uh, the screen elements uh, entries. And I call this little method here that's in my utils function. So let me just show you the utils function. Um, it is, 
just a bunch of random methods so that I've created that's for myself. that's available is because it's, it's probably at the top of this, you, you say var utils, so it's some global... It's being loaded actually right here. It's being loaded yep. in my... It's loaded early enough mm -hmm. that a file later on can use its Exactly, its functions. exactly. Yep. All right, so here's my utils, and load image on entry. It takes a, an object that expects to have a source property on it. It adds an IMG property to it that's an image, which has a source, creates a promise to listen for the onload event of that image. So it's super complicated rocket science. I'm kidding, obviously. Uh, to no, wait but for that image to load. it's a promise that won't be resolved until it loads. Exactly. That's exactly right. So it's no more okay. complex than that. So when I'm when I'm loading up all these screen elements, I'm just getting a big old array of promises, and I'm throwing that into promise.all, and promise.all will wait for all of those promises to finish. In other words, all of the image assets for my screens to load before it uh, resolves that promise. Now, if I mm -hmm. switch over to the are game... Are promises infinitely nestable like that? They or are. At least they are, are. Yeah, okay. infinitely chainable like that. So if I switch over here to the game and I show you the part where I'm loading up my resources, I've got a function called load resources here. You'll notice that I'm literally calling a load method on each of my different entities, each of my different modules. So when I call screens.load, that's that method you were just looking at, I'm getting back a promise which will not resolve until all of its sub-promises resolve. And all of these promises don't uh, mm -hmm. individually resolve, and then when they're all done, then we know that all the resources for the game have loaded. So was... Some of the benefit to this is that it's all kind of, uh, it's all async in a sense, right? It does, like, bir like screens could resolve before bird resolves, before plane resolves. It doesn't really matter, right? It just waits till they're all done and then does its thing. Yeah, exactly. We're requesting all the resources in parallel, quote-unquote, and we don't care how fast or relatively quick or slow those load. We just really want to wait for all the resources to load, and then we know we're good to go. Obviously, you can be much more sophisticated about resource loading, but again, I wanted to be as simple as possible um, rather than as complex as possible <laughs> as some people like to default. Um, you know, so the, the only other complicated or interesting thing about the screens, for example, is that I have that scale to method. It tells me what is the width and height that the screens should scale themselves to. So I'm going to loop through those screens, and I'm going to do some very simple math figuring out the ratios of width and height, and I want to, I want to make sure that it fits within the screen, so I'm looking for the lesser of the two ratios to multiply both the width and the height. So are we looking at, like, let's say you're trying to draw the sun bar or whatever, you're trying to make sure the sun bar fits in the canvas or what? These these aren't actually, that part is done elsewhere. These are actually the welcome screen and the retrace screen. Oh, the, the whole screen, screen, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, to make sure those fit correctly within the screen. So we're just figuring out ratios. It's simple math. Here I'm scaling all those hit areas that I talked about, all those boxes. We're just scaling the X1, Y1, X2, Y2 by that same ratio. And here's where I'm caching the scaling of that screen's image into... A, a, an off-screen canvas. So I just use a draw image to go from the image element that we created to the canvas element that we're storing it in. And that's it. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing else interesting about it's that. It's funny. So I'm trying to think. So you've got to kind of handle all this scaling stuff on your own in Canvas in a sense. So like if, the, if at one point this canvas is 800 by 600 and then you're on some other kind of screen and it ends up being 600 by 400 or whatever the hit areas and stuff are kind of on you to calculate? Well, that that's the thing is, um, you know, in, C, in the CSS world, we know we have, like, uh, all kinds of fancy features built into the web platform with uh, that allow for responsive design with breakpoints and all that other stuff. But when you have essentially thrown up a full-screen canvas and you've taken over complete control of drawing everything, um, basically I had to kind of recreate the notion of a responsive canvas by, as you said, making sure that my... So my canvas stays 100% width and height. It's taken over the full drawing area right. of the browser. But I need logical coordinates that match the coordinates of the actual screen size that I'm in. Uh, so yeah, I do have to do my own scaling. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I have different modules for the different entities in the game. Um, they're all kind of laid out very similar to this, not that much more complex. Let me walk you briefly through how the game actually runs. 
So you'll notice here, this is the, the code that starts out. Um, I'm waiting for the document ready, which is always a good idea, even if you like to cheat and pretend there is no doc ready. I'm waiting for the document ready event. I'm waiting for all the resources to load. I'm also waiting, uh, this is a mobile thing, but I'm waiting to see if I was able to lock the orientation to landscape mode. Um, so I'm waiting to make sure that all that stuff's happened. Snap to viewport, that's an interesting function. Um, that kind of helps us understand what's going on here. So here's snap to viewport. This is going to pull out my window.inner width and window.inner height and set those into val values and then do several more recalculations based upon that. So I'm this orientation locked thing, if I wasn't able to lock the orientation, I need to manually figure out that you are orienting the screen in the proper direction because I've designed the game to run in landscape mode. So if, if you're not running it in landscape mode, I don't want my drawings to be all weird. Um, but that, that makes sure that I uh, actually know what the screen size is. Now, <clears throat> anytime you resize the screen, which can happen if you rotate your device or you drag your browser window or anything else, this is the magic where I tell everything else to be relative to whatever browser screen size we're working with. Uh, so for example, my viewport width um, I want to make the speed of everything relative to a particular known scenario. So I developed it 1200, around 1200 um, pixels wide on my little MacBook Air here. And so the speeds that I figured out are all calibrated to that. But if you scroll this thing, if you scale this thing down to a, you know, mobile device that's one third of the size, I want the speeds relatively to be the same. So I calculate what that ratio is based and on... Speed meaning like literally how fast your little plane flies exactly. and stuff? Yeah, how fast it's, the clouds I, 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 don't really, I wouldn't really think of that as that that needs to slow down to feel the same. Yeah, but it, it does. So it does. I just make that calculation once and then everywhere else that I move something at some particular speed, I multiply it by this speed ratio to, to make sure that it's all relative to the screen size. I make the plane... Uh, this is arbitrary, but I said the plane should be, its width should be approximately one-third of the height of the screen. Um, the plane X threshold is where it sits in the, in the visible viewport. So all of this stuff is just little calculations based upon that probably wasn't the size. first code you wrote right i bet i suspect you like you know you know had a little plane and you plopped it on the screen and, st and started and then you kind of realized oh crap you know at different sizes this plane isn't going to look right or move right or it's too fast or too slow or something like oh i should come back in here and have some kind of speed ratio is that how it went down or did you foresee some of this stuff so for the speed ratio particularly, it did not occur to me that the speed would need to change. That was a refactoring later when I tried it on my mobile device and it was moving like, holy shit, this is too fast. <laughs> it's like, oh. Right, so that's a good lesson it. here, though, is that you can start with even less. As bare bones as this is, this is the result of many refactorings already. Absolutely true, absolutely true. There's, And I've got a long way to go with the code. It's, it's almost embarrassing. Uh, in terms of the quality of the code, you know this, the, like for example, this multiplying by 0.95, like well, there's this magical number 0.95. What are you doing here? Uh, it just feels right. It feels that the screen should be about 95% of the actual screen real estate. So I just picked 0.95, and that was kind of like playing around with it until it looked right. Um, the birds are. Uh, whatever the plane size was divided by 3.5, that looks magical. It is. It just it looks right. I figured out that mm -hmm. the bird should scale himself to about that <laughs> size. Yeah, and if you were with, uh, if there was a other people involved here, you might want to, you know, <laughs> birds are, you know, <laughs> one third the size of planes. Yeah. Because feels right, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so really all this stuff is just scaling itself. I'm doing some pre-calculations of the scaling again for performance reasons. Um, when you try to make any kind of web-based gaming, you're going to want to have uh, some of that pre-scaling. So it really just amounts to having off-screen canvases and drawing from the image element onto that at the correct size. And all this scaling is, is it weirds me out a little bit because I've been like in, not that I've, I've done a, I don't know. I've been in SVG land a lot, and it strikes me as like, gosh, you could, you know, draw if you if the if the the main element here was one big SVG, 
you know, the hit areas would just kind of auto scale. Like you get so much auto scaling for free in SVG, but I have heard at the same time that the performance of SVG isn't nearly what you're going to get for Canvas. So that's that's what I hear from people that on mobile in particular, like if your SVG is anything more than a flat color image, uh, like if it has gradients or shadows or anything else like that, what I heard even before I went into the game, what I heard from people was SVG on mobile devices can suffer in terms of frame rate. This this game runs at approximately 60 frames per second on all the tested device tested devices that I've had a chance to test on. But I've heard horror stories of people throwing up SVG games on a mobile device and getting 10 frames a second. Uh, mm-hmm. And I didn't want that. So I went with the strategy of use SVG for the file format because I do want the native scaling. I want that to be nice but uh, so that I don't get the graininess or whatever. But actually display a can those technologies together. <clears throat> Not necessarily saying that's the right way, but that's the strategy I chose from the horror stories that I had read about. Mm-hmm. So, um, okay. So, is there anything else interesting here? Probably not. Um, oh, one one other thing I want to tell you about the game, just so you understand kind of the flow of events that happen. Uh, so, let me scroll up here a little bit to something more interesting. Um, let's go all the way to the top here. Uh, this part right here. So at the end of all this stuff, after we've figured out the viewport size, we've initialized the gameplay uh, coordinates, which I'll talk about in a minute. We've figured out the scaling based upon the size of the window. Um, we start off by bringing in the uh, the animation that brings in the welcome screen. If I go back to the browser, you'll notice that when I refresh that thing sort of zooms in, right, and it kind of bounces in. I figured that part out. I scale it up to uh, 10% larger than its size and then scale it back down, and that's all just, like, calibrated numbers of frames here. So And it's in the canvas, too. You're not, that's not like that's, a CSS trick or anything. Yeah, it, there's no anything other than canvas going on here. So let mm-hmm. me go to start welcome entering, for example. So function. All those nested thens or chained thens, is that, that's a native JavaScript? That's feature? all native promise stuff, yeah. Okay. Um, if you don't have promises, I should have mentioned, I have a promise polyfill that I'm dropping in right here. Mine's, mine's called native promise only, NPO. Uh, so mm-hmm. that that polyfills old browsers to have promises, but there's no other uh, library. Polyfill here like meaning that. you write it exactly how you would have written it. Right. The polyfill um, uh, brings the browser up to spec compliance. If the browser's older, it brings it. It gives it a capability that's compliant with what you could expect from a spec compliant newer browser. All right. So start welcome entering. Um, I disable the touch handling while the some of those little events are coming in, and it doesn't really matter why I do that, but I don't want you to mess around too much while some of the animations are happening and get variables out of whack. Uh, I start up um, one of my state managements is that I'm welcome entering. I set that to true. I have a little tick counter here, and that's the part I want to talk about is how I actually do the animations in Canvas. Uh, This is not sophisticated at all. It's just simply incrementing a variable by one. So I'm going to use request animation frame in a loop. And if I'm doing things correctly, request animation frame is going to run. It it will run at the same frame rate as the browser, which is going to run at 60 frames a second. So I can use that as my timing for everything else. Uh, So everything is calibrated to the assumption of approximately 60 frames per second. So I start. Sure. A, okay, you're now you're gonna you're gonna call run welcome entering in request animation frame, and isn't right. it, so? And it will it, that will call over and over and over and over and over 60, 60 times a second if it possibly can, right? If it and isn't it the kind of the case with request animation frame that if you are doing say a bad job or something, that it won't it's not gonna like back up and be weird in the same way that like a set interval would would do. It's like a little safer. So what you, what you need to know is that um, it, it doesn't have the weirdness of set interval, which is after you do something, stuff you know is built up in a buffer. So that's the good news. If you are doing bad coding, and or by, by bad I mean your code is going slowly, um, you are going to 
run into a situation where your frame rate drops to say 20 or 30 frames a second and things are going to go slower if your timing is based upon that it means everything slows down relatively which may or may not be the, the experience that you want you might want to mm. drop frames and you could do your own math to figure that out if you were getting 30 frames instead of 60 frames then you could multiply all of those calculations that I'm talking about you could just multiply them by 0.5 and that would drop a single frame in there I have chosen to keep everything based upon 60 frames because that's my target and if I'm not hitting it I need to figure out how to hit it but um, you have the option there of your timings being based on that or not um, one thing to point out, request animation frame only calls the function once. So you need to keep queuing it up every time if you want it to keep going. Ah, so it probably, um, sc at the bottom of run welcome entering, it says request animation frame. That's exactly right. And it right, calls which, itself. Okay. That's exactly right. So I'm about to show you run welcome it's entering. It's a pretty important little line there in the, yep. in the, in the grand scheme of things in this app. That's a, that's a doozy. That's it's very important, right? So... If we are in the state that we are currently entering, I'm going to increment that counter by one. And if I am less than my threshold, which um, I can show you later, but I just have an arbitrary, I think it's like 31 frames or something like that is my how long I want that entering to take. Uh, if I'm still less than that, then I need to do some calculation. This stuff right here, I won't go into too much detail, but I'm just literally figuring out some ratios of... Uh, what the scale of that thing is and what its opacity is um, based upon where you are in that tick count. So if you're at 1 of 31 or if you're at 7 of 31 or if you're at 19 of 31, you're getting a different ratio. So this is just straight up math. And then I draw, based upon those numbers that I just calculated, I draw the welcome screen at that particular state. And then I tell it to do it again at the next animation frame. So I have a start welcome entering and then it defer it, it transfers control over to run welcome entering which goes into a request animation frame loop for however long it needs to run and every time it runs it draws the new screen so if I go to function draw welcome you'll notice that it receives the opacity and the sizing ratio clears the canvas recalculates the X based upon uh, where it needs to put the screen now, sets the opacity. Um, this is using scaling of my canvas to do the drawing rather than scaling the elements. I scale the canvas coordinate system. It's a nice fast way to cheat in terms of changing size. And then I draw the screen and that's it. Uh, so what so strikes me about a lot of this stuff is how there's so many choices going on here of, of how you're organizing things, how you're naming things, you know, the fact that you, you know, where you where you probably stopped and be like, oh, I'm doing this too much. I'm going to make that a utility method and move mm -hmm. it over to this other file. You know, we, we're not seeing you make those choices right now, but we're seeing the result of those choices, you know. So there, you can see that there's a lot of, of, of careful thinking and iteration put into <laughs> yeah but, but but we are at step 50 of that so it was a lot uh -huh. uglier on steps one and three. Oh, i'm sure it was <laughs> so you know there's and, and you've you're using so little framework stuff here so if people are you know very new and in, in watching this you know so much of this stuff is just is just kyle like this is kyle's global utility function this is some function that kyle named in there uh, this is just some variable where you're keeping viewport dimensions that were loaded earlier so you don't have to reach for the window right now uh, you know this is a this this one happens to be a native function so you know uh, and, and you know this is a, a function that Kyle named there's so many there's it's either native functions or things you named in here but very little in here is coming from any kind of framework or whatever yeah there's there's no frameworks like literally jquery is only there for me to do the touch handling the event handling that's the only thing i use it for so other than that it's mostly just javascript that i wrote myself and there's you know the canvas api and request animation frame that's about it i don't use much more of the web platform uh, would there be a that. moment where if you're like oh okay this this thing got a little got a little complicated so i'm going to abstract that out into some other thing and then just call that function that oh absolutely yeah that happens stuff. that happens hundreds and hundreds of times um, i start out my approach is to not 
quote unquote pre optimize so I start out by writing the long form of something and then I see oh wait that snippet is something I've done before that should be a function and then I move it out and so we get to the point where if I can show you for example the run playing uh, function you get to the point now where literally all of these are just different function calls this was one giant thousand line function at one point and as I got better and better at figuring out how to organize things I moved these into purpose-built naming you know named functions so I can look at that and say okay I know I'm updating a bird position I know I'm updating a foreground cloud. I know I'm updating one of the game clouds that I'm trying to hit. I know I'm updating one of the background clouds. I know I'm spinning the propeller on the plane, for example. And this is checking the altitude. Uh, so I absolutely did what you just said, Chris. I little by little refactored out those pieces of code into functions, and I gave them names that I knew would help me understand what I was doing with that particular piece of code. So, the last thing I want to show before we actually have Chris try to write some code, <laughs> that's the fun part of this, uh, the last yeah, thing I wanted to show is um, the game state object. That's the one that's been shown several times. So, I have, an in, I have a function called init game, which sets up a whole bunch of variables that represent all the different things that I need to keep track of during the game. Um, so these are this, these are boolean flags that tell me what state I'm in. Am I entering the welcome? Am I waiting at the welcome screen? Or am I leaving it? Am I entering the play? Am I playing? Or am I leaving play? Am I entering retry, etc.? And then I have lots of these other numbers, like the altitude that the plane is at, which is these units are arbitrary units on a zero to one thousand scale uh, that are okay. going to get co calculated based upon actual pixels. Here's my velocity, how fast my plane's so moving. This is a, obviously a big deal. Like this game state is like, man, this is this is everything that's going on in Exactly. This game. But the nice part is it's one object. You don't have to go searching all over the code. These are the initial states of all these var variables and the, all these variables get changed during the course of the game and they're all named in such a way that hopefully you can at least have some sense of okay, uh, so the the welcome leaving tick count, I named it that way so that I know that's the, the counter that keeps track of the animation when the welcome screen is going away, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have um, a set of the variables that are different based upon the game difficulty. So oh, sure. game easy, like I set them to certain things. The gravity, for example, is at negative 0.4. In the medium, gravity is at negative 0.55. And in the hard, gravity is at negative 0.85. That makes sense. So your plane is pulling to the to the, the, the ground below at a stronger, which makes it literally harder because it's just more, whoa, 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 whoa. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So all the stuff, this one function actually is one of the most important functions in the whole program because this sets up all the initial variables. And as I'm playing and I'm saying, man, I need that bird to move faster. I know exactly where to go do that. It is the speed of the bird. So I have a bird uh, speed right here. I know I need to, t to, to switch this from 4 to 4.5, for example, or whatever. That's all based upon knowing uh, the initial state of all the different speeds and stuff. That's funny. It's, it's, almost like, it's almost like if your game got sufficiently complicated, it might be worth even like giving game testers a UI or like giving yourself <laughs> a UI to control to these values. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. I have thought of that. I have thought of like, uh, could I... Could I factor all these things out into like a configuration file and then have a tool build the configuration file? That may happen at some point. And even like even go crazy and be like, if if when somebody's game testing and they die, be like, what did you think? Was the bird too fast? <laughs> Want to retry it with a slower bird? Yeah, exactly. Right, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here. So okay, how close are we here to? So I think it's time for us to switch now to having you do some coding. Uh, yeah, so okay. why don't you take I mean, control and we'll work on your stuff. I think all you I guess I would have to do is just stop sharing on Screen Hero, but hopefully not lose the call. I don't know if that's possible. I oh, will yeah, stop yeah. sharing my screen. Now let's okay. see if your screen is shared. Yeah, I think I can, with the magic of Screen Hero, share mine, which is a little, it's bigger. So hopefully it's not too hard for you to uh, 
to see and if it is i'll just i'll increase the size of stuff as i need to kind of uh it sounds like you have a um a repo ready for me kind of i thing. do i do absolutely so you're going to want to get this from github if you go to github slash getify and then slash make a game m-a-k-e dash a dash game that is the repo I created here for us to go through this tutorial. Nice. I'm just going to do this, uh, I don't know, the Chris Coyer way, I guess, which is, oh, let's see, it looks like I have to, to scoosh over to my, my normal world here. I'm going to clone a remote repository. Don't pay too much attention to the, to the randomness here. Put this, let's just put it on the desktop temporarily so it's just very obvious. So just for the viewers of this uh, tutorial video, uh, he's using a Git um, client yeah, to do that. Right. It's called we could have done it from the command line as well, either way. Easily. I'm just useless at the command line, so <laughs> I'm going to... Yeah, not useless. I shouldn't. I should never say that, but like, uh, I don't know. I use it for everything else, and I like, I like UIs, kind of. And then I'm going to open the project, uh, which, you know, when, when, I, when I pulled it from... Git, Kyle's made a, just a, you know, or any Git repository has a folder, a directory for itself, and I just opened it in Atom, and, and here it is. So do I need a local server to run it, or can I just go to this file URL? Probably we can not. literally go to file URLs, or you can run a local file server, whichever one you prefer, but you can That's literally just That's kind of just amazing these days that you can go to a file URL and it will run. Yep. But it runs. Oh, maybe not. No, it does. It does. This okay. uh, this doesn't do anything Oh, this for isn't us. Cloud yeah, Sweeper. This you're is... Gonna uh, have to, yeah, this is not Cloud Sweeper. This is the stripped down game yeah. that we're going to make a much simpler one. So what I want you to do is over in the browser, first thing I want you to do is we're going to open up a couple of images. So open up a new tab with that same URL, but um, instead of the index.html, uh, open up images. Oh, I see. So we can... Yeah. Uh, I, can I want you to look at those two SVG files. You can look. So I drew a little cactus and I drew a little weird happy face guy. Those are the two image assets that we're going to use. Where you said you used uh, uh, the the free vector editing thing, right? Uh, it's called Inkscape, is what yeah, I used. And I have that in about here. five minutes. I drew out a couple of vector art. That's all. Wonderful. So I got a couple images here. Uh, wonderful. <clears throat> so the premise of the game that I was thinking that I could have you write is for you to have the f little face guy and what we're going to do is we're going to have him rolling like he's literally rolling so we're going to rotate him we're going to have him rolling along as if he's rolling along the ground okay um, so that's the task that we want to do first and if we get that working uh, and we still have some time i thought we might try to have him have cactuses flying you know moving onto the screen and have you have to jump over the cactuses that's the game premise that wow, I have we here. can we can certainly give it a shot here so uh i do see that this is you know the dom is just this and i have a canvas here and it looks like you've done some sizing for me already that part's uh, already done yep <clears throat> okay so what should we do draw this draw the Draw our, our happy face.svg feller to the screen? or Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to go, first of all, there's a face.js, which I've already created most of for you. So go ahead and open up face.js. And you'll notice this should look familiar. Maybe you could, uh, yeah, up your your thing. But this, I've already pre-filled this out in a very similar way to the stuff I was showing you there in Cloud Sweeper. Um, so... There's my images, face.svg. The native right. size that I create the file at is 300 by 300. That sort of thing, right? So you'll notice in my public API, I have a scale to method that you need to call. The scale to method is how you tell the face that you want it to be at a particular size. And if you go, scroll down a little bit to that actual function, to scale to, you can yeah. see what it does. It's pretty straightforward. We give it a new width, and it's going to go ahead and make the width and the height the same, because it's square, and draw that image onto our, mm -hmm. our, our off-screen canvas. So the only saying. problem is we haven't, uh, we haven't called that function, so it hasn't done it. 
Well, we actually have called it, but you're not getting him drawn on. We'll, we'll see why he's not being drawn yet, but we actually have already called him, and I'll show you that part in a minute. <coughs> okay. Yeah, those are, those are straight-up global variables that you could... You don't really need to interact with them globally, but they're straight-up global variables. All right, so um, if we go over to game.js, I've set up some stuff already for you, but there's plenty for us to do. I've okay. taken care of all that orientation stuff. You don't want to have to worry about that. I've also taken care of all the event handling, so you don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, so it should work on a touch device, sort of out of the box. But what we need to do is actually fill in the details for drawing our little happy mm -hmm. face guy. So if we scroll down a little bit, uh, you want to look for a function uh, that's going to be called uh, run, I'm sorry, sh start function start start play entering so here is where we're going to have the this is the beginning we don't have a welcome screen here this is just the beginning and we have to make some decisions here about what this means to start the play entering what I was thinking and and I thought maybe this would be fun for you to try your hand at is that we could have the little happy face guy start off screen and have him oh. sort of in the intro kind of roll in similar to how I have the plane fly in uh, in the cloud sweeper game so <clears throat> That's what I think the play entering loop should be, is having the little guy off screen and have him sort of roll on screen. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's fine. Let's, uh, let's give it a shot. All right, so the reason I've set those uh, values up, you'll notice that face x start is going to be where face x is and then minus where the face the size. size is. So, so you've already got it set up, so he's just like in the world, he's right over here. We're gonna we're gonna have or him there, but what I want you to do is search for face X and see if that's being set anywhere yet. I don't know, not in this file, I guess. Okay, so we need to set that somewhere. That's the point. Is we need to have an initial value for it, and if our decision is that the initial value is that he needs to be off screen, then we should set face X to uh, uh, negative its width, I guess, or? So, <clears throat> the start uh, value is what we're going to use to, to know, uh, to calculate what percentage is he on screen yet. Um, the negative face size is, uh. <coughs> face X is being set here. That's, there's an equal sign happening here. So we are right. setting face X and face X start to the negative of the face size, which means that he's literally just off screen, like you were oh, saying. Oh, that's fun. This is a tricky way to set two variables at once. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, uh, so um, what we need to do then is in our run play entering, which is you can see we call that there on line 283, um, we tell that to start running with every animation frame. We need to update the face X position to move the guy in. Okay. So here is, is part of game state. It is so like, oops, sorry. let's see. I, got, I lost myself again. Okay, here this is the loop, and it gets run over and over and over again. Yep. So uh, the to do comment that I have down there on line three twenty two. Oh uh, yeah. That to do comment. This is where we're going to want to do some updating of our game state. Yep. So maybe the face X position or the what are yeah. we updating? No, we're gonna we're gonna want to make uh, update face X, and we're gonna want to add something to it. So here we want to ask the question: do, Would I want to update it a fixed amount, um, <laughs> or would I? Yeah, exactly. If I'm, I just did a plus plus plus, if I did just a plus plus, then every animation frame would move by one pixel. Uh, one pixel, right? <laughs> or whatever, or some other increment. Mm -hmm. So if we just did one, does it, uh, let's see what happens, I guess. Nothing quite yet. Or did I screw this up? So we haven't done our draw yet either. Uh, mm -hmm. This, remember the way I organize this is that the run, the run function is going to update variables, but there's also a draw that needs to be called, and that's not being called uh, yet. I see. So we need to actually call the draw Okay. 
So We're not worrying about run playing yet, but if you keep scrolling down, yep. there's a draw intro. This is what we're doing. And you notice, go back up. Uh, yep, right there, uh, the draw yeah. intro function. Okay. okay? So that's going to draw the face on, and we want to draw him at a particular angle. Oh, I see. Oh, look at that. It's already Because right, we want him to rotate. So another thing that we need to do is over time, we need to change the face angle so that he rotates as he comes on screen. Let's see, okay. Okay. I have no idea how to do that, so we'll do this. All right, so if you go to the init game, go to the function init game, just search for function init game, you'll notice that I have face Y starts at zero, which is why he's up there at the top. And if you scroll down to uh, face angle, we start him at zero, and then a face rotating speed that I've given you there. Okay. Uh, that face rotating speed is a magic number that I put in a comments. It represents about eight degrees, mm -hmm. and it represents that in radians rather than in actual 360 degrees uh, value. Okay. Because when we rotate, we have to rotate using radians, which kind of sucks. Um, but uh, uh, what I did was I said 360 degrees, that's a full rotation of our happy face guy. How quickly would I want that to happen? And I said, I'd like for that to happen in about three-fourths of a second. Um, that's a complete just made-up thing, but yeah. it feels about right, that it would be about three-fourths of a second. Well, if I know my second is 60 frames, then three-fourths of a second is 45 frames. And what I said was... How many radians represents a full rotation? And I divide it by 45, and that's where 0.1396 comes from. <laughs> uh, kind of <laughs> magic number, kind of not. Yeah. Right. Got it. <laughs> There's probably, like, real math you could use based on how fast it's moving and pi and stuff, I would think. Yep, but you, wanna, you want to uh, have the simplest approach. All right, so let's go back. Uh, search. So we know we have face angle and we know we have face rotating speed. We know we have those two. Yep. So let's go find um, our run play entering. Function run play entering. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Function run, run play yeah. entering. That one. Right? Okay. So that's moving the face X, but we also want to update the game state dot face angle. Yeah, absolutely. So okay. game state dot face angle is something new as well. Right. It's going to be whatever it was plus uh, it, yeah. that speed thing that I had, which was face. Is it part of state? Game state yeah. dot face. face rotating speed uh -huh. so that's interesting that this is used as a this changes this doesn't i guess but it could i suppose it could change if we wanted to speed up the yeah. that that would just be another oh, that would be acceleration then yeah okay mm -hmm. cool all right so this is going to move him by one pixel and have him rotating i don't know if moving by one pixel is going to be the right speed yet but let's let actually why don't you change that to plus 10 Okay. Just for now. Okay, so the, now let's go find run play entering. So function run play entering. That is I'm sorry, point. we're not drawing here. So after we've updated these, so maybe on line 325, we need to call the draw intro function. Is it part of games? No, it's, no, it's a just function, a function. Right? Draw so intro. Draw intro. Okay. So now let's go find draw intro. Okay, let's see, just find it. There it is. All right, so draw intro is taking the face and asking for it at its particular angle and then drawing it. Taking the face, drawing it at its current angle. And at its face X and face Y position. Yep, X and Y okay. position. So okay. if we save this and rerun the page, we hopefully will see him move in and do some... So we didn't see any rotation, but we did see him move in. Yep. Okay. It's funny, like, you really gotta... 
I'm like, okay, let's start inspecting things and see what's going on. But there's no such <laughs> there is no canvas. inspection when it's a canvas, right? Yeah. <coughs> All right. So uh, this does bring up the point that you can use JavaScript debugger tools to look at the state of particular variables. So, for example, that um, face the game state dot face angle. We would want to make sure that's not a global variable, but if we uh, were to set up a watch and watch for that variable in our debugger. So for example, um, if on line, uh, let's say line 387, if you write the word debugger, and uh, that is going to tell, if you have developer tools open, that's going to tell the, develop, the developer tools stop at this point, like if it, it had been, it's a breakpoint that we did yeah. programmatically. So now we want to ask, what is the current value of uh, the game state dot face angle? So is it a global now? It's not a global. Go back into your debugger. It's still we're going to do this debugging in the debugger. Okay. So if you look at the debugger, uh, maybe can you zoom that in a little bit? I'm having a little trouble seeing yeah, your screen. Absolutely. Let's see. Let's go like this and like this and like that. There you go. And like that. Get it? Yeah, okay. So um, <clears throat> we have the face angle, game state dot face angle. If you hover over <coughs> face game state dot face angle there in line three ninety if you oh, just Oh wow, over look at it, that. It knows stuff about it. It should tell us some stuff about it. So it's telling us that it's not a number, which is why the rotation is not occurring. So we need to figure out why it's not so if you go back to your code editor Mm -hmm. Take out that debugger statement or just comment it out for now or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then let's go back up one step into our run play entering function. Yep. So um, we, we were... set it in here, didn't we? we? Or we tried to. We were trying to set it and something wasn't working correctly. So Is this we need a to figure... moment for another debugger or not Exactly. Really? That's exactly what I would Should do. Should I do it I'd, after or before this? <laughs> I'd do it before the statement. Okay, so we'll rerun this again, and it has stopped me at this particular moment. So we want to inspect those variables. What is face angle right now? Uh, how do? But it's after, so it won't tell me, will it? Uh, s oh, yeah, it will. no, it'll tell you, yeah. So zero. it's at zero. What is game state dot face rotating speed? It's hmm. the point oh three four. Okay, so it scaled it down because of your window size. <coughs> oh, I so see. And when you add zero, it's so that's strange though that it. I don't know why it's coming at nan. I don't know why it's getting into a nan value. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know either. It was just the, or the ordering of things and stuff. This is even this was very valuable to me. I didn't know you could do this. I don't know. As a CSS mostly, I know I know how those. <laughs> now the JavaScript work. debugger is fantastic uh, for this kind of thing. This is the old school way of doing it is to put a bunch of console.log statements in there. Oh That's yeah, absolutely. A terrible idea. Don't use console.log statements for sure. <laughs> All right, so let's um, let's try. Uh, going back to the draw intro function. So, yeah, you can comment out that debugger. Let's go back to the draw intro. That's where we're calling it, and that's where it is defined. It looks like we're not, like, incorrectly naming anything. If we put something that doesn't exist... I mean, Canvas works the same way any other JavaScript would. Like, if we called something that didn't exist like like bar would bar would be like I don't know what bar is right it would like still it's that's still gonna be a JavaScript area yeah, bar is not defined okay. but with a property if that property didn't exist we wouldn't get nan we would get undefined oh so, so it's bar. not a uh, so get, get or like game if it's a property that doesn't exist it doesn't error oh look at that it doesn't error yeah, I didn't know because that. the properties just result in an undefined value. Hmm. Okay. 
All right, so here, take out game state dot face angle um, from that function call, and let's just pass in a fixed number for right now. Pass in like 0 0.4, 0 0.4. I just want to see if that actually is able to have him at an angle. <laughs> He's at an angle, but it's a, a constant angle. Yeah. So at least we know that that part's working. At least we know that we are getting him at So an the angle. problem is face angle is, is nan right now. Is yeah. right here. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know why this is happening. If I, I wish this was our uh, exercise, but this is just accidental. But we're getting to learn something about using developer yeah, tools. Yeah, no, I know. People so. love this stuff. Like, what, what the <clears throat> heck is, what, what's the problem, you know? So it's kind of like, how often does drawing control get get called once or is this one of those ones that gets called a million times that was exactly the next thing that i was going to ask let's search for the places where draw intro is being called draw intro and if it's being called it has paren so there's one and done there's only one place it gets called which is in run um, play just enter. for just for grins take off the parentheses in your search oh okay just for grins so that's where it's defined called so defined, that's the only place called, it's defined, getting called, called. yep now, it's true that draw intro expects that draw opacity, but we're not using that one yet. I was going to have it um, also fade in was going to be our next step. Okay. So we don't need to worry about not passing that. But just for completeness sake, you might pass the number 1 there on line 329. Just pass in 1 so that there's a opacity of 1. So it's still not rotating him. Uh... Let's see. Uh, but it, I mean, it's because it. I mean, what are we expecting it to happen? Is that that not, that that angle gets updated over and over and over and over again? To yes, it gets changed to a different number, which represents. But this function only gets called one time, so I guess it makes sense. To... No, it's getting called over and over and over again um, because the run play entering is being called over and over and over again. Oh, okay. I just like verifying that over and over and over. <laughs> yeah, it's getting called over and over and over 60 times. And it's being least. called 60 times. And the, do you know why it's being called 60 times? Uh, well, no, I guess not. I mean, I know we've talked about 60 in terms of request animation frame. All right, so let's just to make sure you understand that and the listeners also understand, go back up to the run play entering function. <clears throat> this function says if my ent play entering tick count is less than my play entering tick threshold, then keep going. Yeah. And otherwise, move on to playing. Oh, I see. You see that? This is just the intro is what we're working on. This is just the intro right now. We were trying to get it so that yeah. the guy would just sort of roll in uh, yeah. as our intro to our game. <coughs> All right, so let me so think So maybe here. there's some variables that are, I mean, named wrong would be the easiest. Uh, fine problem. Where did I put that? I mean, did I, do I for sure have this right? Face angle? I mean, I guess I didn't write that part. So. Um, let's go up to uh, the function init game. Yeah. So we're definitely there. starting it out at zero. And then we're and face rotating speed. That definitely exists. And you're multiplying it by speed ratio. Maybe the speed ratio is, is getting to be zero. So Oh, no, no, it's not. We verified that it was 0 0.03 or something. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting one. I think we can crack it, though. I think we can. I wish I... Uh, I'm wondering if maybe I should switch back to me driving for a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And we probably shouldn't go too much longer. I think people... There's already, like, a million things that people have learned. Not to mention that this Make a Game repo is out there and exists, and people can grab it and play around themselves. But, yeah, do you want to take over? Here's what I think we should do, Chris. I think we need to do a part two of this screencast yeah, uh, we could. where we come back and do some more playing with it. But I think we can fix at Remember least that getting you can the drive guy to rotate. Literally right here if, if that's... 
Okay, so yeah, so let me um, let me think what the best way to debug this is going to be. Um, I'm going to go to down to run play entering, and what I'm going to do is instead of adding it to the speed, I'm just going to come up with a random number here. I want to see if that works. That's like pretty high compared to what it was, so hopefully maybe he spins really fast now. We'll see. Um, we should see some spinning. Let's try that. Yeah. Alright, so something to do with that. Um... Maybe it's so low. Maybe it's too low. You know, like this face rotating speed ended up as like point zero three or something. So maybe if it's point zero three, we just never notice it. Um, but we were... Oh, no, you can notice it. Yeah, we were actually getting a NAND value. Right. Which is interesting. Um, it's particularly weird. It's like it's getting overwritten at some point. I'm going to try to drive one more thing. Yeah, it's something that we're missing here, and I apologize to the listeners that I don't remember what is I'm happening. telling you, I'm telling you, not everybody loves it, but the people that listen to CSS <laughs> trick stuff, I've done so many screencasts where I screw up, and they're like, oh, it's so interesting to see what the, uh, the debugging strategy is here. And this is all new debugging strategy to me, especially without, you know, a lot of help from the dev tools. Yeah. Like you get so much help with DOM stuff. And there's just no DOM here. But, you know, debugger was, it did help us a good amount. All right, what I wanted to go do was find the on resize function, because that's where the speed ratio should be being set. Yep. So I want to put a debugger here. Just to verify that that's working correctly. So let's try that and re refresh. Oh, I didn't save. I'm sorry. We need to save. So it'll jump us to the right tab, probably. Yep. All right. So we want to hover over the speed ratio and see what it says. Okay. So it's telling us a 0.78. So that's a good news. Um, now I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to drive for a sec. Uh, so weird that if it's I mean I'm thinking like is there like some closure kind of thing hurting us where this value isn't available outside of it but game state is like it's not global but it's it's available within game js everywhere so what we're going to do is have two breakpoints, and I want to make sure we see what order those happen in, because <laughs> we could have a sequencing problem here. So let's try do it. Click the stop and then refresh. Uh, let's see, stop refresh. So it's going to hit the first. It's going to hit one of them, which I don't. I don't know which one that was. I guess. But we could... No, that's the that's the correct one. It should have. Oh, okay. Uh, let's plus. It goes pause. to the second debugger statement. That's what that little control does, right? That's the opposite order that we would expect that to happen in. So that's part of the problem. Um, init game is not getting called after. So I think it's, this is all my fault. I didn't when I was stripping stuff out of the Cloud Sweeper code base. I didn't make sure that init game got called again. Uh, so. I mean, this kind of makes sense, right? It's just these two functions happened in the wrong order, and a value that's, wasn't available when it needed to be available. Yeah, that's exactly what I was uh, going down. So, 
just as a quick little hack here so that we can keep moving uh, it's because I removed the whole welcome screen thing <laughs> uh, because the welcome screen is the one that called init game again but because I had removed that for this code base that wasn't happening. Oh, again. interesting. So these happen in order. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Okay. So if we try this now, let's see what happens. Oh, we should take out the debugger statements. Can you search for those real quick? Yeah. All right. So this is—is is it totally back to normal? Did we? Are we? We're not I adjusting so. by a fixed value. We're, adju we're uh, adjusting by the... Oh, yeah. Look at that. All right. So he's rolling backwards, um, and that means that we should make uh, the angle subtraction subtract it rather than add it. Boom. All right. So now he's rolling in. <laughs> All so right. I'm going to count that as a huge win. I didn't... Uh, realized that I didn't know if we were going to be able to fix that bug. I'm glad we fixed it. No, that. and I, I kept with it because I, you know, I think that it, that it's kind of valuable to, to understand those things. And you kind of fixed it in your head, realizing that this function didn't get called as, as many times as it needed or whatever. But that, but you got there through, you know, through using debugger tools and just experience and stuff. So that I think that's useful for people, especially if Let's you haven't learned, no, you didn't know about debugger at all. Let's clean yeah. up just a few more things. We'll wrap up here in like five or eight minutes, if that's okay. Let's clean up a few more things. Yep. Um, so <clears throat> you see that he's just kind of rolling into this arbitrary location, which is not really what we want. We want him to roll into um, to a specific point. And the purpose of... The, there's a game state variable called... Uh, uh, X threshold. If you go over to the code editor... And search yep. for x threshold face x threshold so what I said here was basically we want him to be we want his left side to be positioned um, at an x position that is half of how whatever width he currently is so he'll be just inside but not a full width of himself inside of the game window that's the place that we want to get him to at the end of the intro but we're going to start him off screen, completely off screen. And we don't know how far he needs to move to get there, but we do know how long it's going to, we want it to take, and we do don't know how far to go. So using those two pieces of information, we can do a little bit of simple math and have it calculate how f much it needs to move him each time so that he ends up at that X threshold location at the end of the animation. So that's the last thing I'm going to have us do is do that. So if you go to run play entering, yep. <clears throat> All right. So run play entering here. You notice that we were just saying plus ten um, because that was just an arbitrary amount to move him. But what we want to do is say plus a certain amount that figures out that that is going to be calculated based upon how far, how far we, we need him to go. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. So <clears throat> what we want to do is instead of saying game face X is equal to face X plus some value, we just want to recalculate face X every time. And this is a simple, this may seem a little bit of a complex math, but it's actually a pretty straightforward math equation. We take the starting position, which was called face X start, if you remember. Yep. And we position. take the okay. X threshold. Okay. So the f uh, I think it was called face X threshold. Yep. So what's And actually I did that in the reverse order. So we need the first one because minus the second it. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's how far he needs to move. And I would wrap that in parentheses. Mm -hmm. We'll do that. Okay. Now that's how far he needs to move. So let's just say that's 100 pixels, right? Just yeah. for simple math. The way we know what position we are currently at is to ask where is the play entering tick count with respect to the play entering tick threshold. Those two variables up on line 321, they go from 0 up to 60, right? 
So yeah. if we take play entering tick count divided by play entering tick threshold, we're going to get a percentage value, a number value that represent our percentage of the way through our animation. So, so take so like the percentage through or whatever is this one yep. divided by this one? Yep. Okay. And if we take that percentage and multiply it by the total amount that he needs to move, then it will automatically position us correctly at each frame. So if we multiply it by, I don't know if that's a good name, but there you go. So that might just do it right there. That's where we're going. Yep, let's try it now. And that's where it was that is that the X threshold? That's where you kind of were envisioning him ending up? We came too far in, I think, so I might have missed something here. Let's uh, make sure. Or maybe he started to it looks like he's starting right here, not off screen. Right. What did we miss here? Um Well what is this threshold all about? Where does that is that is that a um, kind of a magic number deal too? Uh, the that's calculated in the on resize function. If you look for function on resize, the x threshold is the size of the face halved. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, let's go to the place where we set x start face x start again. We're setting those place. to. That's one place where it starts, but this is a. Or is that it? Oh, what you're looking for? Let me think. Um, oh, I know what's wrong. Uh, we need. We missed one quick thing. So let's go back to run play entering. I know what we missed. There we go. So when we set face x is equal to something, we need to st say it's equal to face x start plus this new value that we just recalculated. And so we need see. to wrap all that second stuff in another parenthesis to make sure that there's... There we go. Uh, I think that will work now. There we go. That's exactly what we wanted him to do. The only other thing that we'll do on cleanup is let's give it a different Y for now. I was going to have us calculate the Y based on altitude, but we don't have time for that. So let's just um, go to go to the function init game. Because it rolling at the top is weird. You're going to make him roll it's on weird. the bottom. I'm going to have him roll at the bottom. <laughs> so just so it doesn't look so weird. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So right there where we say face Y, let's say viewport dims that one dot height minus the face game y. state dot face size that makes sense so it's as tall as the window is minus as minus tall as, his height yeah mm -hmm. okay almost uh oh what did we miss did we not save or Maybe it's a out of order error again. Oh, maybe face Y is getting calculated somewhere. Let's search for face Y. I might be having that being calculated somewhere. Yeah, look at altitude and stuff. Maybe we Okay, let's here. let's go to that function. Just yeah, yeah that's fine. Just, That'll work too. Yeah, so there. Yeah, so there what was that? That was that does some fancy thing that we should probably get into another time. <laughs> we'll we'll get into that in part two. But what what that is going to do is that's going to allow the the guy to jump whenever we click the space bar and make him oh, jump. Neat. There'll be an altitude that changes and the gravity that pulls him back down. Yeah. So face Y will be calculated on a on an animation basis as well. Pretty good stuff. So if you'll recall, everybody, that we started looking at a uh, 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 cloud. Sweeper, cloud, cloud sweeper, cloud sweeper, and looked at th that code base, which will also be open source, I believe, uh, yes. under Kyle's repo. At uh, um, perhaps by the time you're you're watching this, I'm not sure, but this is a Should be. very stripped down version of that that gives you quite a bit for free. Again, not a framework, but it's like how you might approach organizing, naming, structuring that kind of thing. A canvas 
game like this because uh, because the performance is good. You can draw SVG to this thing. I mean, this could be you know this could be uh, 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 ends up, end up being a very smart thing that uh, somebody could grab and run with to to make their own game. Because you you could do anything with this. This isn't to replicate Cloud Sweeper. This is to manage and deal with any kind of stated game whatsoever. Exactly. Yep. All right. So in part two, we'll have the guy jumping over cactuses. We'll come back and do a part two in a little, in a few weeks, and we'll have him jump over the cactuses. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. Let us know what you think of the the, the pairing style podcast. I know I learned uh, a, a heck of a lot here, and hopefully y'all did too. See you later. Thanks a lot. Cool. I can just cut it right there. I was using a fancy song.